right, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deftula, AFA's Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Aerospace Nation Speaker Series. And we're really pleased today that uh, Dr. Will Roper uh, could join us. Dr. Roper, as uh, all of you know, is the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. And as the Air Force's Service Acquisition Executive, He's responsible for the Air Force's research development and acquisition totaling an annual budget in excess of $60 billion spread out over 550 programs. So Will, uh, thanks very much for uh, taking the time to join us today and uh, welcome. Um, I'd, I'd like to start off uh, by giving you some time to address your vision for Air Force acquisition and the initiatives that you're pioneering. Uh, coming from the Strategic Capabilities Office, I know that probably seems like a long, long time ago. Um, you've introduced a number of innovative approaches to the acquisition community, and you're still pushing forward with new ideas. Um, I know our audience is eager to hear the latest, so let me turn this over to you. Thanks, Dave. I really appreciate uh, you joining me today for hosting this event and for continuing the great work of the Mitchell Institute, uh, even as we're socially distanced. Uh, I think we've all learned that there's quite a bit that we can do using modern IT uh, to help us connect even when we can't be physically located. So uh, thank you and thanks everyone for joining today. I'll be very brief with, and the Q&A with the audience is much more important than opening remarks, Dave. I, I have come into this job really dovetailing with the last one I was in, and that is thinking about long-term strategic competition and the role that the Air and the Space Force need to play in it. And as two services that are inspired and generated by new technology, there's so much that we have to fundamentally change about the way we take new ideas, build them, and get them into the hands of operators in this century that will look fundamentally uh, diametrically different than the way we did it in the last century in the Cold War. Uh, because in that last epic, technology was slow, it was expensive, we were exceptionally good at it, we still are, and when we had a technology breakthrough, things like stealth and computerization and satellites, uh, we needed to proliferate them because that advantage was one that gave us the edge on the battlefield. And those technology gains were hard fought, so you could rest on them longer than you can today where technology is cheap, ubiquitous, fast, happening all the time, happening 80% uh, outside of the government, though we're still a major player and do a great job. So the model has to change because technology is everywhere. And we don't know which technology is gonna be the next big mover and shaker on the battlefield. There may be multiple ones. So the fundamental shift we have to make in acquisition is getting out of that lethargic chess playing mentality in the Cold War, where the moves were well thought through, but slow and few and far between, uh, as few and far between as our new programs were decades apart and get into a model where we can make moves all the time, play more of a game of speed chess than a tournament chess with our opponent. Where we're making quick moves that, that create a challenge, a dilemma for our adversaries that force them to respond to us as we're already thinking through our next move. And the basis for those moves should be continually ingesting new technology that give us a slight to moderate to maybe even great uh, technological edge, but knowing that we face opponents that will be able to make those same moves as well. So the speed at which we do it, the agility by which we do it are the most important things in this century. And one thing you can say about the Cold War acquisition system, it was not agile. It was very good at trudging to a goal line no matter what the cost. We simply can't afford to do that today. And so coming into this job, I've, I've really wanted to see if things that worked for me at the Strategic Capabilities Office would work here, and quite a bit does. You know, delegating decisions to the lowest possible level, encouraging a culture of innovation, embracing failure, which is easier said than done in government. It's an easy talking point, but when you're sitting in the chair and talking to people whose careers have historically depended on not making mistakes, asking people to embrace failure is a big ask of trust. Uh, and then finally, bringing in new technologies that will allow us to design for agility. You, you've heard many times, Dave, in the Pentagon, cost schedule performance. Even if you're not an acquisition professional, you've heard those 
those triumvirate terms that are the building blocks of new programs. Well, cost and schedule will always be important, and schedule uh, exceptionally show if you're competing against a peer. You've got to win the race to market with your new tech. But performance is going to be uh, extinct in this new model because performance, uh, it connotes a goal line that you cross and when you cross it, you have the advantage and you win. And so what I'm hoping to do is bring in technologies like digital engineering, DevSecOps and software containerization, Kubernetes, open systems architecture that would allow us to exchange steady state performance with continually adapting agility. I want cost schedule and agility or adaptability to be how we measure programs in this century. And so I know we'll talk about a lot of initiatives today, the Digital Century Series, the myriad software factories that we have across the air and Space Force, Kessel Run, Kobayashi Maru, the enterprise-wide cloud, Cloud One and Platform One, which is our fully container-native development environment that programs like uh, ground-based strategic deterrent and B21 are moving to with great effect. And the Digital Century Series, which is uh, a huge passion of mine. I know it's a topic you've had interest in. But these are things that are meant to not just speed up the process, though they will, and hopefully confound our adversaries and how quickly we move. But I hope it confounds them in terms of the agility we achieve. And I'll know we're getting it right when our operators are not waiting on technology. If it's available now, we ought to be able to seamlessly put it inside of our platforms, large and small. So I hope we'll get there, but it, it begins by getting a few programs right over the goal line. So I'm excited about the Pathfinders, about next generation air dominance, about Skyborg, about T7, ground-based strategic deterrents that are really blazing the trail, but I'm bringing our satellite programs along as well and a couple of uh, candidates for weapon systems too. I think you can build anything in the air and space force this way. We need to get after it. And then finally, you know my passion for going the industrial base. So our defense primes are gonna continue to be heavy movers and shakers for us, but uh, we're not gonna win against China long-term. If they've got a nationalized industrial base, they have access to their entire talent pool. They have access to every co company that's within their border. And we are only working with a small subset. And that subset continues to collapse every year under the pressure of programs that are too few and far between to sustain diversity and continual competition. So we have to have a new model that encourages companies to come in and work with the military, but not necessarily put them on a path to become a defense prime. We're not going to get another defense prime in this century. So we need a new model, a new industrial based model. That's not a defense industrial based model. It's an industrial based model where companies can work in defense because they're technology companies and technology is what enables cutting edge defense. But that company can still work on the commercial sector as well. And I think we've had great progress in our AF Ventures, Air Force Ventures process and team that we're taking uh, to a next level. It's been experimental up till now, but this is the year that we have to make it codified, uh, steady state across the Air and Space Force because we can't make it innovation. We can't make bringing in new companies and working with commercial startups and scale ups. We can't make that innovation and feel it's a nice to do on the side. It's imperative. It's the bread and butter of winning the competition long term. So the word, Dave, is competition. That's why I'm here. And there are myriad things we have to do to get it right. Will, thanks very much for that uh, context and uh, insight. Um, and thanks for all that you and your team are doing to build the world's uh, greatest aerospace forces. I've got to compliment you uh, on your passion, too, because that makes an extraordinary uh, difference. Now, 2020 appears to be a pivotal year, uh, and not just because of global and national events. Uh, the Air Force is smaller and older than it's ever been, and it needs to step boldly into the future uh, with technologies uh, while simultaneously preserving capacity and sustaining its high ops tempo. Uh, you mentioned a lot of that. Um, I'd like to take our conversation uh, further and focus on your vision for the future. Uh, beginning with your efforts to incorporate leading edge technologies enabled by quantum physics into Air Force capability. So you're getting ready to hold the quantum collider event next week. Uh, and although it'll be virtual due to COVID, 
is designed to bring government, industry, academia, and small businesses together to explore pioneering quantum technologies and applications. I understand another pitch day will be part of this event. Um, can you describe a bit what you're hoping to achieve uh, with this next uh, event of yours? Absolutely, Dave. And the one thing we've learned during COVID-19 is that these virtual events are not second fiddle. They are not plan Bs and won't be on the other side of uh, this pandemic. Uh, we've had amazing attendance at venues like the Agility Prime Kickoff, uh, which is our flying car program in the Air Force, which is a super cool initiative where over 6,000 people attended every day, which is amazing participation we would have never had at a brick and mortar based kickoff. So I'm very excited about Quantum Collider on the 15th and 16th of June. So the reason we're doing this, we've done myriad pitch events across the Air Force and Space Force. We're getting quite good at it. We brought in over $1 billion of private investment, venture capital into our programs last year. And that eclipses the 15 years prior combined. So amazing progress by our AppVentures team. The Quantum Collider is a different beast because in addition to the Small Business Innovative Research Funds, which I'm very passionate about, so if you hear SBIR, if that acronym slips out of my mouth during this discussion, that's an account of, of nearly $700 million that is just meant for early stage investment in companies, and we're doing a great job of getting more out of it. But we have a separate account that's called the Small Business Technology transfer uh, research account, so STTR, which doesn't get as much hype because it's not as big, it's a uh, hundred million dollars and change, but it is meant to spin technology out of universities into companies that wanna try to get it to the goal line for uh, you know, a mission, whether it's commercial or military. And I see huge potential to create a wonderful ecosystem between university researchers, tech startups and venture capitalists to try to get university research of so many fields that could affect the future air and space force and create a faster path to spin it out. We have an account dedicated to just that. And very similar to SBIR, we should expect a lot more from it. So we have had a fantastic success with our MIT AI Accelerator. It's $15 million per year that I stood up at MIT to help spin technology that's AI related out of MIT, the university into programs that can benefit from it. And I have, I have seen just a huge culture shift from our program teams, um, understanding the core principles of AI through browsing. So a big shout out to the tremendous help that they've done. The idea that we can collect that step into the world of quantum physics. So we hear that in the news frequently. Um, it's going to eventually make an impact. We don't know when. It's difficult technology to mature. And so the idea is to create a steady demand signal from the Air and Space Force that we have over $100 million per year to help university researchers and companies get technology out of the lab and into uh, businesses that might be able to get it to the military goal line. And I, this is gonna be um, you know, high stakes, big risk, big reward. But if we don't start doing this year after year, uh, then another country, another military might get to the quantum goal line first uh, at, at some probability, I guess you should say, in the realm of quantum physics. Um, so we don't want that to happen. We wanna win the race uh, to that goal line. And, and this is gonna be our first event to show a steady cadence, a steady demand of not just doing research, though we love research in the Air and Space Force, of having a conduit from research into business. And whether it ends up being quantum communication or quantum sensing or quantum computing or hopefully a combination of all three that make it to the goal line first, this is about creating an accelerant so that our military gets that advantage. And this won't be the last a uh, collider event that we do in the realm of accelerating research. There are so many other areas we need to be exploring from uh, synthetic biology to new materials, all of which can have a huge impact. 
So we're doing this tech field by tech field, and I'm excited to participate uh, from the comfort of my, of my home or my office, and I hope that a lot of people watching, uh, if you're interested in quantum physics, knowing what universities are working on, what businesses are thinking, this is a great opportunity to get up to speed. So please join us. Very good. We uh, look forward to the hot wash on uh, Quantum uh, Collider. Um, there should be some interesting insights on the impact of uh, COVID on uh, small tech businesses from that venue as well. You mentioned some of those. And I think you're spot on. I think a lot of us find ourselves actually working more and doing more um, by not taking, that, uh, taking up those uh, hours traveling back and forth and uh, also being able to collaborate in a, a much more broad fashion. Um, speaking of small businesses, developing alternate timing, sensing, and communications could be a game changer. Uh, and reaching out to small business could bring new and innovative ideas to the forefront. Um, but doing business with the government is not easy, no matter how good the idea. Um, you, you're, you recognize this explicitly, and, and that's the impetus behind your pitch days. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the success rate has been for these small companies to actually feel their products um, and what can be done to help them become even more successful? No, it's the results have been have been off the charts, Dave. We've in the last 18 months, we've brought over a thousand new companies into the Air and Space Force industrial base. Now they're at the beginning stage. They're exploring their ideas, they're doing research and prototyping, but it begins with getting companies through that front door so that they can move on to steady state contracts and programs of record supporting the warfighters. Before we started the app interest process, the average time from getting the first uh, non-SBIR dollar after the, that initial investment, when you get the first program dollar, has been over six years, so quite a long time. And in the app interest process, we have shortened that down to as short as months for software companies and AI companies that can transition immediately to the warfighter. And so our process is very simple, Dave, and this is the year we'll be codifying it. I'm excited because uh, I've elevated AFWorks. It's now a direct report to me, and I just announced uh, Colonel Nathan Diller, who is the lead of Agility Prime, our flying car program, is going to be the director at AFWorks 2.0. And their job is to really get this app ventures process codified as one of their main level of efforts for me. We've got to get this right and keep bringing new industry blood in, new ideas in, so that we never become stagnant. We're always a moving target for as simple as possible for companies of all kinds. Continue making a thousand small bets every year. So, um, about 50K in size, help a company that may not understand the Air and Space Force. And even if you did, we're changing. So if you knew us 10 years ago, I, I hope that there's some learning to be done. So we don't want that learning to be part of how you get an idea to us. So we, we had this open door, this, this small bet to start the relationship, get that idea connected to a potential mission. Then we move to the medium bets. These can go up to as high as one point. 5 million. We hope to do around 300 of these per year. These are at the pitch events that you've heard so much about. Live Shark Tank type events where we've got a warfighter, an acquirer, and a technologist. They're the source selection team and they're making a decision with that industry pitching their idea live where you can ask questions and not just understand the technology uh, because that's what you get through a normal solicitation. We need to understand the team. We need to understand the drive, the passion, the vision. Because for early stage R&D, you're buying the team as much as you are their idea. And we have to believe in them. And the cool thing about that medium bet step is that the program offices have to bring their own funding to the table. So we match it with our investment account. The matching is the inducement. And often when we do matching funds uh, in the Air Force, we see private matching as well. And so you have a chance if you play in this adventures process as a program office or a MAGCOM that you will triple, quadruple, even, even a quintuple your money if you play. And so last year alone, we saw over $240 million of program office funds be put on the table to help match this investment account, which is fantastic. It's more than I can trace in, in any previous year and many, year, many years combined. That is what makes our process different, Dave. 
It's what makes private investors want to co-invest with us. Last year, over $3 matched to every Air Force dollar we spent in our app ventures investment process. So three times our money coming in from private investors. And the reason why is not our R&D money, though it helps. It's the fact that our process requires matching funds from the customer. The warfighter, the program executive officer does not have to put their money on the table. They have other bills to pay, as you very well know, Dave. There is never enough money to go around. But the fact that they do, that they see something in a company and they want to take that next step is such a valuable product market fit. It's a delineator in the tech startup world that it is uh, with great result inducing venture capitalists and private investors to match and to match multiple times over. And that's what leads into our big bets. Uh, we just announced those right before COVID-19 hit about maybe 20 of those per year where we really give companies with a great idea a chance to fully productize, produce, and have that game-changing effect that we see in their idea. I'm sure it's not perfect, but if we continue to refine this and make it easy, you don't have to give up equity to go through the app ventures process. And private investors love the fact that we're coming into the ecosystem because we're de-risking their investments. So we have a chance to play a wonderful partnership role. Uh, go after riskier things than private investors can go after and, and play a, you know, a role in this ecosystem that might level the playing field against the advantage that China has in a nationalized industrial base. I don't, I don't believe in their system. I don't believe long term that picking winners and losers is going to create more constant and routine innovation than market dynamics will. I believe in markets, but we would be unwise to underestimate the near-term advantage that their companies get, getting access to capital very early on and not having to be on the pitch circuit like so many of our companies are. So what we're looking to do is find a way to bring the military market to, to bear in a way that's synergistic, symbiotic with the commercial market. So we're still getting market dynamics but we're bringing the whole of what our nation has to offer, including partnership with the military, as one of our value propositions. Well, congratulations on your success. And, and once again, for uh, instituting these kinds of uh, innovative uh, uh, operations and perspectives and approaches uh, that uh, sound like um, are really accelerating. Um, uh, last week, I had a conversation with uh, Lieutenant General Jack Shanahan, head of the Pentagon's Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, um, where he told me that the Air Force is designing an autonomous aircraft uh, to attempt to best a manned fighter in air-to-air -air combat. Uh, can you give us a little more insight into this experiment? And what's the selection process for the fighter pilot? Will you consider retirees? <laughs> Well, I, you know, ever, ever since Star Wars first uh, debuted, this idea of being able to fly with autonomy to support you and, and cute little beeps and squeaks, right, has just really caught the imagination. And it's time to make that real. And so I am excited about our R2-D2 program, which it's not what we call it, but that's the what I refer to it, which, which isn't just trying to create an autonomous pilot that can replace the people that we have today. One thing that you learn when you go up and talk with the world-renowned AI experts at MIT at their CSAIL Institute is that AI in its current form is fragile. And so it's fine if it's mainly helping you with entertainment-related functions. If your app crashes or it gives you a wrong choice about which movie or song you should listen to next, well, no big deal, right? But on the battlefield, an adversary will be there trying to thwart and confound that AI. And it's very easy to do. So those researchers at MIT, in a very cute example, showed me how today's greatest computer vision algorithms, these deep convolutional neural nets that for Google and other companies are able to churn through all the stuff that we're posting on uh, Instagram and Twitter and all the other social media feeds that are able to extract features from those images and, and tell us what they are with no people in the loop, that the second you introduce an adversary, you can have the world's best algorithms 
pick an image that you and I would look at and be able to identify immediately and fool it into thinking that it's anything. Because the way these algorithms work, the way these deep convolutional neural nets work, just is, is simply different than the way the human brain works. We are so adept at, at dealing with patterns and also knowing if someone is trying to mess with us. And so we're gonna need a new form of AI that is hardened against an adversary. And part of the reason that we're engaging in basic research is that this is probably not gonna be profitable as soon as we like. So we can't wait for this to show up as the bread and butter of the internet. We need to accelerate this. And if we do it in a way that's smart, we won't just be accelerating it to help the military, though I certainly <laughs> intend to do that. That is the job I'm here to do. But that kind of hardened AI is what we ought to have in drones that are delivering packages or self-driving vehicles. And so that is, that is part and parcel of what we're trying to do with our R2-D2 program is not just build a pilot that can fly an aircraft. That's gonna be very easy to do in a benign environment. We wanna design a pilot that can deal with an adversary that is intentionally trying to mess with them, with the data that they're being shown, trying to thwart that convolutional neural net in a type of algorithmic warfare that has never existed but will on the future battlefield. And then we wanna see where does it break and where does it not? And my expectation is this next generation of pilot is not going to be ready to hand the reins over completely to R2-D2, but, but neither will they be willing to go into combat without R2-D2 if R2-D2 is available. And I expect, just like pilots in the era of stealth, had to develop an instinct for stealth, for radar cross-sections, even if they didn't understand the fundamental physics, they had to get a sense for it, just as if it was inherent to their body. I expect that the next generation of pilots will have that instinct for AI. They'll know when it's going to be strong and when it's going to be weak. And I think the first thing that we'll field in programs like Skyboard, where we'll be teaming an autonomous wingman with, with a manned platform, is when to, when to trust the AI, what roles to put it in so it has the best chance of having a positive impact, and when the human needs to override and reset. And I expect this is going to go back and forth, just like stealth counter stealth went back and forth. Continual cat and mouse game of trying to create an advantage and then break that advantage and then fix the break and break the fix forever and ever. Amen. And I don't know where the end's going to be, but I know we have to be driving the research uh, on this because it's one technology that appears to be able to leaven, level the playing field of human advantage. And as you know, Dave, we have amazing pilots and we have always been able to put the human advantage on the table as the final discussion point in the meeting. Well, if all of that is not true, our pilots are the best and they are, and they will continue to be the best if we give them this new technology that will take their game in a completely different dimension. And what I'm really excited about in programs like Skyborg and others where we're going to instantiate this uh, AI pilot. The pilots we have today, Flying Eagles and Raptors, are so excited about this, because this is new. This has never been done before. No one has flown, flown with a digital pilot. And so the roots of the Air Force are all about breaking boundaries and doing new things. I think we forgot that a little bit in the wake of the Soviet Union collapse. We didn't have that adversary pushing us. And we're getting back to, we ought to be doing new things all the time and everywhere. And an AI autopilot or a wingman or, or R2-D2 is something new. Can't wait to get it out on the battlefield. Well, that's, uh, that's great insight. Thanks very much. Um, it sounds to me like um, you're taking a very pragmatic yet accelerated approach to capitalizing on AI uh, to build a synergistic team along with a pilot uh, to be able to defeat any adversary and not rely only on I, AI by itself. Because we simply, we're not there yet. Hell, I, this morning I tried to get Alexa to move from my family room to my kitchen and she wouldn't do it. Uh, so come on. Uh, we still have a long ways to go with AI. Um, on that uh, related topic, um, it's been a while since you introduced your vision for the Digital Century series. Based on your pillars of the digital thread, um, agile development, and open architecture, the intention behind the digital engineering series uh, is to compress the development and acquisition OODA loop. 
Can you speak to how you've been implementing this uh, new force design and uh, acquisition paradigm? Absolutely, Dave. I, I truly wish I, I could, uh, could reveal more about the Next Generation Air Dominance Program. The, the classification, which, which we need because we don't want to tip our hand to the adversary about what types of capability are going to enter the battlefield, uh, is holding back our ability to talk more broadly about the tremendous progress we're making in harnessing uh, what I call the digital holy trinity, which is digital engineering, uh, agile software development, uh, especially containerization, and modular open system design. And although I'll go into as far as I can on NGAD in a second, but you can see what is possible in programs like T7, um, which is amazing, right? We're, that program has just started and we've got two airplanes that are out that are flying you know, every day. I mean, when has that happened? We probably have to go back to the 70s till new airplanes from scratch designs have appeared as quickly. And it's challenging our system. We have two airplanes, they're not X planes. I hear people say that, they're E planes. These are digitally engineered. They may be the only two identical airplanes that we're flying today in any of our programs. And so the fact that they've been digitally engineered and the fact that those digital models allow us to go back and revisit design if we wish, or we can take that model into assembly and we can model it and improve it without actually having to build a production line, or we can take that model all the way over into sustainment and make sure we don't do something dumb in design that's gonna jack the cost of sustaining systems. That's what the digital thread is. So if you're watching this you've, and you've wondered, what are these terms? And I, I worry this is going to become like talking points or buzzwords in the Pentagon. The words won't mean anything. The, the digital twin is the model of the system, and it'll change as we fly airplanes. So if, if you fly one airplane, you know, 10 hours and another one has flown 30 hours, their digital twins will be different because you're actually modeling the wear and tear. That's the term most people remember but it's not as powerful as the digital thread. The digital thread is what I just discussed, that you can, you can take these high fidelity models and you can move them from design into assembly, into sustainment, and then back. They're all tied together. The, the thread is not cut in any place. So you're never creating a gap or seam that's gonna bite you in the future. And uh, it's amazing to see what programs like T7 are able to do. We're not, we're not in full scale production. We're not sustaining the system yet. But we're doing work right now in that program we would normally not be able to do until we had the first 22 aircraft show up. And we believe the results because the models are of such high fidelity that there's no distinction between the real world and the digital world. If, if Boeing came in and handed me the design for the T7 on a hard drive and said, here it is, I would take that just as surely as if I had been delivered the airplane. That e-plane, that electronic representation of the airplane is our future. And you can build things that aren't just airplanes that way, which is why at our last Space Acquisition Council, we spent the whole time discussing nothing uh, related to space. We had all of the programs, ground-based strategic deterrent, T7, and Next Generation Air Dominance come in and talk with all of our space acquisition professionals about the, the boundaries they are breaking and the new things they're learning using this digital holy trinity. And it's, it was exciting to see that, yeah, we can build satellites this way, we can build weapons this way, and we intend to. Now, Next Generation Air Dominance is the first program that is going to try to change the model based on that digital thread. So kind of upload in your mind, you've got this model, you can go from design to assembly and to sustainment, you can work on all of them simultaneously, uh, without creating a seam or gap in your system. What we hope to do, Dave, is create a model that does not require mass production for industry to recoup their upfront investments. If we have hundreds, if, if not thousands, uh, over a thousand of the same kind of aircraft, that is not fast, it's not agile enough, it's not adaptable enough to go back to the opening remarks. We have to adapt, we have to continue to change and force our adversary to respond to us. Uh, that model from the Cold War of mass production doesn't work anymore. And what we see uh, as being possible is if we use the digital thread appropriately, we don't have to have a large assembly line with heavy tooling be the only way we build airplanes. 
We think that smaller scale assembly, uh, where we're leveraging less skilled workforce, smaller tooling without having to set up the, the monument tooling that's fixed forever, we think that is possible. Again, the, the digital engineering enables that. And what we hope to do is create a way to work with us that's between X planes and, and mass production, full scale production, where we're building things in smaller quantity. And T7 shows me that that's doable because two airplanes are flying right now. We are learning from them right now um, that are as identical as anything in our inventory and they exist. So we could build more in that model without moving to the large factory production. And although in, in T7, we are gonna go to full scale production because we need to replace our trainers and make sure the next generation of pilots is ready. For our sixth generation airplane, it probably makes sense to do continual spirals. So cool things we're thinking about are ways that we can slowly change the airplane year by year. We're not talking about radical changes as some people hypothesize. We're thinking like the automotive industry that's already gone all in on digital engineering that's able to change uh, their cars slightly year to year, but that doesn't change how you drive them nor how garages repair them. It does not jack the sustainment cost to something that is, not a, that is not affordable, as long as the designers are aware and design within sustainability constraints. Well, how do you do that? You've got the digital thread that traces all the way to sustainment. If a designer proposes an upgrade to an airplane and it makes sustaining it fundamentally different in cost, then the sustainment engineers can raise their hand say that's a bad idea and here's why and if it makes a change that is going to raise their hand and say that's a bad idea and here's why this technology if we get it right there's there there are a ton of things we could get wrong we are the government after all uh, but when you look at the automotive industry we can continue to spiral our systems in a way that will make us a difficult moving target and one of the things that I've, I've challenged our next generation here to on this team I hope this is one of the hallmarks of the program and the digital century series of, of slowly ever evolving, ever upgrading airplanes that we can still fly and maintain as if they were a mod. One of the hallmarks is, is that we're never waiting on technology. If there is a whiz bang technology we really want in our airplane, but it's just not mature enough to go in yet, that we can use our digital thread, design it in, go ahead and produce the airplane and field it. And then once that technology matures, drop in that subsystem after the fact with, with zero rework, learning curve, all of those things that, that bite us when we try to do them in an analog world. In a digital world, they are possible. And if you just look at the automotive industry and how radically transformed it has been, uh, there is our shining star. Let's follow it. Um, very good, and, and there's so much we could talk about here. Uh, just very, very quickly, although I think you might have answered this uh, in, in your last comment, because what you describe is uh, indeed disruptive to the defense industrial base. The implication is that we really can't move to this kind of new force design and acquisition approach if industry remains entrenched in industrial age methods and thinking. So how does the service get there, given that this is a very different model for the industry, but then perhaps you, you just laid out a model and that's the auto industry. Is the aerospace industry agile enough to, to transfer to what you describe? Um, it, it is if, if the government has the same technical depth. We can't just hope that industry will walk in and, and give this to us. In many cases, we are having to drive it because we've had the experience on programs where it's been successful. The thing I would ask for all industry colleagues that are watching is go all in. Go all in on this technology. Go all in on container native software development because it creates such a radically different acquisition model that everything we know from the past doesn't convey. But you have to invest up front. You need these digital tools. You need cloud-based infrastructure at multiple classification levels. And 
Uh, Dave, the direction we're going is providing that to industry, but making it something that is government furnished. Industry gets a license. So the government and industry are working on the same infrastructure. And it's been amazing seeing the possibilities of that with programs like ground-based strategic deterrence. Uh, now you don't have to exchange documents anymore. The models are the deliverable. They are the e-plane or the e-missile or the e-satellite. I don't need you to print them. And if you did, they're not as good as actually going through the model itself. Uh, but these models, they're, they're, they're extremely large data files. You don't want to send them via your email. In fact, they'll probably get blocked by every government uh, screening device we have. So you have to invest in the networks. You have to invest in the training. And when I say this is a digital holy trinity, I pick that term with malice of forethought. This really is like a religion, Dave. You go all in on this and you get all of the benefits of the rapture it provides, or you don't. You really can't do this partially. There's, there's not a thing I have seen as a partial digital program. You're either fully digitally conceived or you're analog. And what I would wish for every new program, and as long as I'm here, it'll be required, every new program is fully digital. So for industry, go all in. It is worth it. It is going to change everything about how we design, how we assemble, how we modernize systems. Because, hey, you got to make a, a change to that system you already fielded. Well, you still have the electronic e-representation. You can work on that modernization and not just how to design it, but how to install it and how to sustain it without ever having to cut into the first platform. You've already learned everything you need to know. So learning curve is dead. And these digital tools, this digital trinity killed it. Okay, well, I gotta tell you, Will, I, I've got several more questions, but you uh, uh, really ran through uh, a lot of insight in what we've talked about so far. And I wanna save some time for those uh, questions from uh, our audience. Uh, so uh, real briefly before we go there, I, I really thank you for your insights today. Um, we certainly value the dialogue, and um, most importantly, we value your initiative and thought leadership. It's just what the Air Force needed. So on behalf of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies and all of uh, AFA, um, we wish you and your entire team uh, the best as you would deal with the challenges of the future. So keep up the great work, because the airmen of tomorrow are going to be riding your legacy into combat.